Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Christopher Liu, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for this morning's lineup of talks. As a background, I'm a consultant at the Department of Pain Medicine at SGH with an interest in treating musculoskeletal pain disorders such as rotator cuff disorders, frozen shoulders, arthritis, and back pain. Additionally, I also have an interest in managing facial pain and hip disorders. Now, uh, the Singapore General Hospital Pain Management Center is located at SGH Block 722. It is the largest multidisciplinary pain clinic in Singapore, staffed by more than 10 consultant pain physicians, nurses, physical therapists, and acupuncturists. We see a vast range of pain disorders, including both non-cancer and cancer pain, and we offer a broad um, range of minimally invasive interventional pain procedures for these conditions. It is my pleasure today to introduce our three speakers to you. But before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to point out that you can post questions to our speakers in the chat below in the Q&A section. Uh, these questions will be answered as time permits after the three talks have concluded, and sometimes the answers can be answered um, in the chat box as well. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Lim Chenwei. Dr. Lim will be speaking on the topic of interventional pain uh, for hip and knee joints uh, in old age. Dr. Lim is an associate consultant at the SGH Pain Management Centre. He graduated from Monash University, Australia in 2011. He undertook further training at the Singh Health Anesthesiology Residency Program and qualified as a, resident, uh, as a specialist in anesthesiology in 2020. He subspecializes uh, in chronic pain and has a special interest uh, in interventional pain treatment uh, as well as medical education. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Lim. Good morning, everyone. Let me just uh, share my slide. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, Dr. Rim. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to uh, join us on uh, a sunny Saturday morning uh, to talk about uh, some of the interventional pain treatment uh, that we offer in the Singapore General Hospital uh, Pain Management Center. So I'm Dr. Lin Chen Wei, and uh, to uh, kickstart the day, I'll be talking about interventional pain treatment for knee and hip in old age. So firstly, it is a very common condition. In fact, a few local studies uh, have been performed over the past uh, many years, in the past uh, five to seven years. And it has found that uh, up to 20%, uh, one in five uh, persons over the age of 60 suffer from uh, su uh, varying types of chronic pain. And uh, up to 20% uh, between the age of 60 to 69 uh, suffer from symptomatic knee osteoarthritis, meaning that they actually have pain that arises from a knee osteoarthritis. So it is a fairly common problem uh, and uh, I am sure it is not uncommon to uh, know of someone who has uh, knee pain or has undergone uh, some knee replacement surgery in Singapore. So what are the causes of knee or hip pain? And this is an image of a knee joint. And as you can see, it is a, it is a fairly complex joint. Uh, and when you have pain in the knee, it can be due to uh, various causes. It can be due to the ligament. Uh, and in fact, if you have a look, there's a, a radi two type of ligament, the, the, the anterior, which is the front ligament, the posterior, which is the, 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 the back ligament. And there is a media and a lateral ligaments. That all, and, and all this uh, can be a reason why uh, you may be suffering from knee pain. And another very common reason is that uh, as we age, the joint space of the knee decreases due to wear and tear. And when the cartilage rubs against each other, uh, it can also cause pain. So 
the various causes of pain are as such. So quite, quite, I, I think one of the most common reason in the elderly is osteoarthritis, which refers uh, to a condition where the cartilage surrounding the joints is worn down due to aging and wear and tear. Uh, and for this kind of uh, condition, uh, responds very well to uh, uh, knee replacement because uh, essentially uh, when the joint space is reduced, uh, a replacement of the joint will uh, technically solve the problem. Other causes include uh, tendon tendonitis, which is inflammation of the tendon, which is usually caused by overwork, such as, such as uh, too much exercise. Bursitis, uh, which refers to uh, inflammation of the bursa, which is a sac filled with fluid near the joint and can be inflamed from uh, injury, overuse, or postural problem. It could also be due to fractures or referred pain from another location of the body, commonly the spine. And quite rarely, uh, knee or hip pain can be, a, uh, can be a late sign of cancer when the cancer has spread it from the original source to other parts of the body. As a result, if you suffer any degree of knee or hip pain, uh, the most important thing to do is to please seek medical attention early. See a general practitioner, uh, be it uh, just uh, at a private GP near your house or at the polyclinic. And usually, the doctor will start off with a basic investigation such as x-ray. And the most crucial thing is to rule out any life or limb threatening conditions such as a fracture or a cancer. And if the pain is mild, we generally uh, commence conservative management, which means a non-invasive, no needles, no injection, no surgery, just with uh, painkillers and physiotherapy. And only if the pain persists despite uh, this conservative management. Uh, it might be wise to consider referral to a specialist in hospitals, such as uh, the pain specialist, the orthopedic specialist, or the rehabilitative uh, medicine specialist for further uh, advice and treatment. So when is interventional pain treatment suitable for me? Be be before I delve any deeper, I just want to clarify that uh, where we, when what, what interventional pain treatment refers to is uh, various types of uh, injections that we offer. But such injections are not the usual, uh, the normal painkiller injections that uh, some GPs may offer. Uh, because we, we do have patients who come to our clinic thinking that it is the same injection, uh, it is the, the painkiller injection that can be uh, offered at a general practitioner. Uh, the interventional treatment that we offer are Slightly more, uh, slightly so more sophisticated, slightly more advanced, requiring uh, x-ray or ultrasound to perform and are uh, quite targeted. So when is such uh, interventional pain treatment suitable for me? It generally is suitable for patients who have moderate symptoms that uh, despite conservative treatment uh, do not uh, show good effect, but yet do not require surgery yet. So for such patients, they, they may consider uh, some form of uh, interventional pain treatment to help uh, reduce the pain. Uh, it is also suitable for patients who have severe symptoms uh, and surgery is recommended by the surgeons. Uh, but, but for various reasons, the patients do not wish to undergo surgery. Uh, for example, patients is uh, OH, uh, or rather to be, to be, to be more uh, precise, uh, if, if there's a 90-year-old patients who come in uh, with knee osteoarthritis and has a uh, fairly bad health and the risk of undergoing surgery is very high. So for such patients, maybe uh, it might be more appropriate to uh, avoid the surgery and uh, manage the pain with uh, such interventional pain treatment. Uh, uh, and also is suitable for patients who, are, despite having surgery, are still suffering pain. And therefore, uh, surgery def, uh, is somewhat uh, has been unable to resolve the pain. In such conditions, uh, interventional pain treatment may be suitable. So unknown to many uh, people, uh, pain specialists in Singapore are uh, qualified uh, anesthetists as well, or anesthesiologists, uh, as some may say. So uh, re regarding the, the risk of surgery, uh, we could be quite familiar with some of the patients who 
uh, at high risk and unable to undergo surgery. So when should you consider and why should you consider inter interventional pain treatment? Uh, the main advantages are such. Firstly, it is minimally invasive and uh, with much lesser risk and side effects uh, compared with a surgery. It can uh, gen uh, it, it generally reduces pain and improve function and the quality of life. It is usually done as a day procedure. For example, patients usually get uh, they report to our clinic at about eight o'clock in the morning. Procedure is done at eight thirty or nine, and usually by lunchtime they can be discharged. It is it is relatively pain free. Uh, we give local anesthetic at the skin. And subsequently, there may be little or no pain for the rest of the procedure. And it can help reduce your painkiller requirement and the associated side effects such as drowsiness or constipation. As many of the patients who have uh, such chronic pain usually end up uh, requiring fairly high dosage of uh, strong painkillers. And the stronger painkillers generally come with uh, more side effects such as drowsiness and constipation. Hence, uh, such interventional pain treatment may help reduce uh, the, the, the painkiller requirement. And when should you not consider interventional pain treatment? Uh, the disadvantages are as such. Firstly, the effects are quite likely to be temporary and unlikely to improve the underlying disease process. Therefore, repeated treatment may be necessary every few months or every few years. And it is important to uh, also know that uh, such interventional pain treatment do not cure the underlying disease. For example, if a patient has a knee osteoarthritis, the injection is not going to uh, increase the joint space of the knee. It merely helps cope with the symptoms so that the patient can potentially uh, undergo other uh, treatments such as physiotherapy to improve the, overly, overlying, uh, the, the underlying disease process. But it is unlikely to cure the disease process. So in SGH Pain Management Center, or in short form PMC, uh, we perform uh, the interventional pain treatment uh, in our own uh, clinic uh, uh, compound. We have our own fluoroscopy suite, which is a medical term for X-ray. Uh, and this is how it looks like in the entrance. And in the fluoroscopy suite, as you can see, in the foreground, that is uh, the bed where the patients will lie on and uh, various procedures are performed. In the background, you can see uh, a device in the shape of uh, a mirror image of a C. So that is a, a X-ray machine, which we use to uh, identify the critical structure and position our needle to perform the various uh, interventional change treatment. So I will just be going through some of the interventional pain treatment that uh, we commonly offer in our center. And then we'll just summarize before we move on to the next segment uh, by Dr. Lin. So uh, quite commonly, we perform this intra-articular uh, steroid injection or hyaluronic acid injection. Colloquially, uh, to many laymen is known as the gel injection. So the hyaluronic acid acts as lubricant and the steroid helps reduce the inflammation. So it, is, uh, it can be effective for patients with knee osteoarthritis where the joint space is reduced and therefore uh, the lubricant can help reduce the friction between the rubbing surfaces of the various structure. And as mentioned, the steroid will reduce inflammation and hopefully reduce the or rather slow down the disease process. Uh, it is done under x-ray guidance for higher accuracy, though some GP clinics do offer uh, such injection, but uh, usually done blind uh, in uh, the GP clinics. Whereas over in uh, SGH uh, PMC, uh, we perform it under x-ray guidance to be uh, almost 100% sure that we are injecting in the right area. And when effective, the results can, may last up to months. So this is an image, uh, x-ray image of a normal knee joint. As you can see, uh, there is 
uh, some space between the two, uh, between the top bone and the bottom bone of the knee joint. And in a diseased knee, as you can see, the, the, the space starts to narrow and there is a bit of overlap of the shadow between the top and bottom joint. And in the middle of the image, we see uh, uh, what appears to be a needle. Uh, and that is what we use to uh, direct, uh, to inject the uh, uh, hyaluronic acid and steroid into the knee joint. And the black color shadow that we can see in the joint space, that is basically a contrast medium that we use to confirm the positioning of the needle that uh, that, allow us, that allows us to be uh, fairly certain that we are injecting the uh, medication and the right area. Another type of interventional pain treatment that we offer for pain and heat, uh, for, for knee and heat pain, uh, is nerve ablation treatment using radio frequency or cryotherapy. Uh, basically, we identify the nerves responsible for causing pain uh, using ultrasound and X-ray. And then we insert special probes close to this nerve and special devices are used to numb the nerves uh, semi-permanently. Semi uh, and therefore, as a result, these nerves are unable to uh, transmit the pain signal uh, to the brain. Uh, and when effective, uh, the patient uh, may report a reduction in the pain uh, of the knee, knee joint, and the results may last between months to years. So, Again, this is an x-ray of a knee joint, and you can see uh, the long black line uh, is a shadow of the needle, which we use, uh, which is positioned using uh, x-ray guidance uh, to identify the various nerves that are responsible for causing, uh, they are responsible for transmitting pain from the knee joint. And this is uh, the photo of the patient undergoing treatment where the needle is being directed uh, uh, whereas the needles are already positioned by the x-rays and uh, the machine in the background uh, is being used to uh, numb these nerves, uh, making them unable to transmit pain signal to the brain. So in summary, uh, our advice is that uh, if you suffer from any type of joint pain, knee pain, hip pain, uh, or other uh, joint pains of any other part of the body, uh, please seek advice early because it can be benign or it could be life-threatening. Uh, interventional therapy may not be appropriate for certain condition. Uh, so uh, do not think that uh, every knee pain uh, can uh, is suitable to undergo some, some of the pain treatment, uh, the uh, interventional therapy that we mentioned earlier. However, when suitable, uh, such interventional therapies may help avoid surgeries. So therefore, uh, for your situation uh, or your loved ones, do consider the various options, which are the surgery versus the interventional therapy versus just uh, conservative management with medication. And based on the pros and cons, uh, decide what is most suitable for you. And many conditions can actually be well controlled uh, conservatively, right? uh, i.e. without surgery, if detected early and managed with medication, with appropriate exercises, with or without interventional treatment. Uh, the message behind this is that uh, if, if, if you have any uh, joint pain, seek treatment early. Because in early stages, there can be, we have uh, many tools to manage it without surgery. However, for many of the cases, uh, for example, the late stage osteoarthritis, uh, when the disease process is quite advanced, it becomes difficult to offer um, such interventional pain treatment because it, it, it has become so advanced that surgery may only be the, the, the only option to cure the problem. And lastly, it is also important to uh, note that knee or heat pain may not necessarily arise from the area of pain. So for example, uh, we, we do see patients who come to us uh, telling us there's knee pain, but on further investigations and on, 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 on further history taking, we, we realize that actually the issue is from the spine, such as a spinal stenosis, uh, resulting in a referred pain to the knee joint or the hip joint. So uh, with that, I end my segment.
And I will hand over to Dr. Lin Shifeng, who will talk about uh, uh, managing uh, neck and back pain. And we will take questions uh, at the end of the at the end of the uh, the three talks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lim, for sharing with us about interventional pain options for knee and hip uh, joint pain. Um, then our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lin uh, Shifeng. Uh, Dr. Lin Shifeng is currently a consultant uh, at the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Management in SGH. He received his MD degree in 2012 and subsequently pursued uh, anesthesiology training in Singapore and became a fully certified uh, uh, specialist and anesthetist in 2019. He practices pain medicine and anesthesia at SGH, and he has an interest in regional anesthesia and interventional pain management. He is also actively involved in medical student and resident uh, teaching. Uh, so um, Dr. Lin today will be um, speaking to us on managing neck and back pain. Dr. Lin. Okay, thank you, Chris, for the very kind introduction. So just allow me to share the screen. Yeah, so everyone can see. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start my talk. Uh, okay, so uh, this is uh, Dr. Lin uh, Shifeng, uh, and uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, the back pain and the neck pain management. So uh, it is very common, and although most of the time it's not really a serious condition itself, uh, the neck pain and back pain can be very frustrating, and especially when it interferes our daily life. And some of our patients do have like very chronic uh, neck and back pain, and the problem just doesn't seem to improve. So in our pain management center, we actually see a lot of patients with neck pain and back pain. So something we notice is that our patient may have a lot of misconception about the pain, uh, like the disturbing them. And these misunderstandings can actually lead to very harmful coping strategies and make the recovery process prolonged. So today, I'm going to give you an objective account of the neck and back pain, uh, the neck and back pain, and to share some important facts and to clarify the general myths, the myths about uh, how we recognize the pain problem and how we manage it. It's a very broad topic, so I try to cover as much as I can within these 20 minutes. So uh, the back pain and neck pain is truly uh, the commonest problem actually we encounter. So throughout our life, about 80% of us will experience at least one episode of lower back pain. And similarly, the neck pain affects almost 60% of us, so it happens at least once. So quite often, it affects like our young patients, especially when it's due to the lifestyle or sometimes due to some occupational injury. Of course, uh, in Singapore, we see more patients, especially like senior citizens affected because of the aging and degeneration. So for every uh, pain patient, we of course want to find out what's the underlying cause. But unfortunately, it's just uh, a bit complicated. And to be honest, sometimes the diagnosis of back pain and neck pain may not be that easy because there are so many simply like too many structures over your neck and back that can potentially cause the pain. So most of the pain, of course, come from the soft tissue, such as the muscle, the tendon, as well as the ligaments. The bone itself, especially your spine or the backbone, can be a source of pain. Of course, it could be also kind of like joint pain. Between the each segments of the backbone, there could be like some small joints supporting each other and become a source of pain when it degenerated. Or it could be the joints outside the spine, such as like the shoulder pain, can also experience as kind of neck pain, or the joints over the pelvis can be felt as like back pain, where sometimes like you know related to the buttocks. And of course, there's something uh, relatively like rare, but just like sounds more serious is the pain happens when there's a pinched nerve. So for patients going to see a doctor. Uh, the truth is most of the patient doesn't really uh, get a very clear diagnosis at the end. Uh, about 85 to 90% of the patient actually have the pains like uh, what we call a non-specific neck and back pain. And actually it's like uh, more due to the mechanical causes. That means there's some wear and tear of the muscle and soft tissues. 
only about 10 to 15 percent of patients actually get a very identifiable, identifiable cause. But we still manage these patients uh, with this, uh, symptom treatment as well as the proper exercise and therapy. Uh, for example, the one of the most common uh, problem is actually the back strain and the back sprain. That means actually the uh, injury to the muscle and tendon or sometimes the ligaments. So the good thing about these kind of non-specific or mechanical kind of pain is that they have a good chance uh, to recover by themselves. So this is, for example, uh, uh, like uh, this is a diagram showing the natural history of the typical neck and back pain. So majority of the patient actually get recovered by like three weeks time. So about 80% of the case actually uh, like do well uh, with a proper management and treatment. Then of course, there are like 90% of cases uh, like uh, recovers like by six weeks time. But there's a some of the patients, like about 10% of the patients become like really a serious chronic problem. And that will like, uh, probably is like more difficult to treat. And uh, some of them actually come to our clinic for help. So then you may ask like, could it be something really serious? Uh, of course, uh, there are a small chance that you may have a severe underlying problem that causing this kind of pain. But the good thing about uh, the back pain and neck pain, as I mentioned just now, is like 90% of these patients are really due to the mechanical causes. That means like there's not really something really serious. It's more like soft tissue wear and tear. Uh, the really concerning uh, condition underlying, for example, infection or cancer, uh, are overall uh, it's like unlikely. For example, the infection should be less than one in 10,000 kind of chance. And only like less than one in thousand chances said that you are having actually cancer, uh, like causing the back pain. Then of course there are like some fracture cases that we also see, uh, but all these accounts for only maybe like less than five percent. So when do I really need to worry about my pain? So actually, uh, there are a few warning signs that your body will tell you that there's truly some serious problem. Uh, definitely, uh, if your pain comes with fever and loss of weight and loss of appetite, this could be a warning sign that you should see your doctor early. And also, if your pain comes with your, weak, uh, with your leg and arm become very weak or very numb, then it could be something really seri uh, serious due to the nerve impingement. And of course, for those who are having a recurrent or chronic pain problem, sometimes the pain experience might be different from your previous like, typical pain symptom. Then this probably is, uh, in the case there may be some uh, new issues underlying. Then we'll probably need further investigation. Then of course, if there's like pain prevent you from sleeping or wake up, uh, wake you up at, at night, then it also could be something really serious. So of course, a lot of uh, patients may ask like, at this stage, do I really need a scan? So yes, if you have uh, the symptoms or like warning sign that I mentioned just now, the doctors will do the necessary assessment and order the scan as needed. But most of the time for those non-specific or mechanical kind of pain, imaging is not really useful because the treatment and the speed of recovery is doesn't really affect it by your, uh, whether you do get an X-ray or MRI or not. And sometimes the imaging uh, itself, although it's very widely used and uh, actually quite sensitive, but it doesn't really help with the diagnosis and doesn't really pinpoint what's actually causing the pain. And sometimes the conclusion can be a bit like confusing. So I'm sure a lot of you uh, have heard about it. So like uh, something called like slip disc. It is like a, a quite, quite common condition. And for those who are not very familiar uh, with it, the slip, uh, the disc is something like a soft jelly kind of cushion that between the, each segment of the backbone. Uh, normally it support the spine well, but with the normal aging process, uh, the structure or like the content of the disc may become like deteriorated. The shape may change and actually may herniate it out, but it doesn't really always cause the problem. So actually, if let's say a middle-aged man like me go for MRI scan myself, there's a high chance, like more than 50% of the chance, I may pick up some like change or like abnormal, uh, abnormal signs on the scan, but doesn't mean I actually have the pain symptom. 
or you could be like patient who really have a back pain or like pain like going somewhere else. But the imaging study suggested uh, some changes, but doesn't really correlate. So all these kind of situation uh, may be quite confusing. So at the end of the day, your doctor will decide whether these kind of changes noted on the scan is truly the problem or not. So when you read the report, probably you don't have to get too nervous about it. So next, I'm going to move on to talk a bit about like uh, how we can actually manage our pain. So uh, one of the thing is about the self-management. So like many other like chronic medical problems, so how we can manage it successfully is that we have to work together between the uh, healthcare professional and the patients. So the healthcare professional can give you uh, some advice, help you to find out the problem and give you medication and the treatment to address the symptoms. But on the other hand, in the long term, how to prevent the pain from happening again or getting worse actually relies on the patient themselves, like how they choose, uh, use the correct knowledge and skills to deal with the pain and to help to like, you know, uh, themselves to stay healthy in the long term. So the management of pain is, uh, I think the most important aspect is actually to break break this like persistent pain cycle, especially for those like chronic pain patients. So uh, I mean, it's like we all understand that the patient when they are having pain are very worried about like getting further injury. So they don't want to like uh, participate in certain kind of activity or like exercise because they worry that the, the injury may happen and the pain may get worse. But I think this is not really uh, appropriate, especially uh, in the long run, if you uh, like reduce your activity too much, your, your muscle will actually get lost and your body will be less flexible. And all these will actually make you more vulnerable to pain. And of course, the psychological impacts could be huge. Uh, because of the reduced activity and increasing pain, you may get more worried, you may get more anxious, or even become depressed. All these may make the pain become really a chronic problem. But having said that, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions I want to clarify about like uh, how to do a proper rest and uh, how we can actually do more exercise when we are having pain. So a lot of you may believe that, oh, I should just like rest, or especially bad rest when I'm having a back pain. This is partially true, especially when you suffer from a very acute injury or like you are, you know, the pain symptom is really bad. Maybe bad rest for a while can be helpful. But on the other hand, if you like do like bad rest for a prolonged period of time, it does not really uh, help with the pain. And actually you should just seek uh, a doctor for help. And in fact, a prolonged bed rest can be really harmful because that will make your back muscle become really lazy and uh, your spine become really flat, which is not really the, how it is designed. Uh, and you're, eventually you will lose the normal support that actually uh, is needed. And also uh, as a result, because uh, you are not moving too much, you may end up having blood clots in your legs. And of course, as I mentioned, you may become depressed because you basically cannot do your daily activity at all. So all these will actually make the back pain worse. So some patient may then ask like, okay, maybe I do not do bed rest, but also don't want to do exercise at all. I think actually just the opposite, you should do more exercise as you can. So there is a, uh, all kind of study actually like, you know, uh, investigating what kind of exercise uh, is more helpful. I think the finding is that almost all kind of exercise is like a help with the pain symptom as well. And as well as like uh, making you uh, like, you know, keep your, preserve your function and help you to cope with the daily activity better. And uh, of course, if you go to see a physiotherapist, they will teach you a lot of like uh, more guided and targeted exercise. For example, a few like uh, diagrams here showing like uh, many useful techniques such as like back extension or stretch kind of exercise. And of course you can also like go for swimming if you can tolerate it. And actually these are very useful activity to improve the pain. And in fact, if you, even if you don't go for a physiotherapist, you can still choose the like activity and exercise you like. 
so what I normally tell my patient is that it really doesn't matter if you like, for example, see a physiotherapist regularly. Of course, they can help you, like guide you better, like how to do exercise. But the key is, like, the more important thing is to like uh, to do it regularly at home and practice, let's say, two to three times a week. And each time, like more 20 to 30 minutes or so, as long as you can uh, cope with it. And all these will eventually benefit you in the long term. So uh, then I will move on to talk a bit about the painkiller. So again, a lot of uh, misconception about how to use painkiller. So definitely painkiller is needed in pain management. Uh, as I mentioned uh, just now, uh, the key to manage the pain successfully is to break this uh, persistent pain cycle. So because we worry about pain, so we tend not to move too much, we actually need some help to address the symptom. So that's where the painkiller comes in. And also help to actually improve your mood and help you to cope with your daily activity better. But of course, there are usually two kinds of extremes, like uh, some patients believe that they should not take any painkiller at all because their body may get used to it. They become like addicted. And some patients, on the other hand, are taking really too much. And especially those strong painkillers in the long term, uh, that truly become a problem. So I think at the end of the day, it's not about like which painkiller to use. There's simply no like magic bullet that would treat all kinds of condition all come with the side effects, that is true. But on the other hand, you need to use the medication correctly to help your body to cope with the pain symptoms. So I think it's uh, how we can optimize the pain management, uh, pain relief and improve your function. But at the same time, we need to balance the adverse effects. So there are a lot of painkillers available in Singapore. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. Uh, Panadol is the most commonly prescribed. And of course, sometimes you will see as a kind of combination with other drugs such as like Masorelaxan or Phenagine, or we call NRX, those kind of uh, blue and white tablets, or it can be combined with a weak opioids called codeine. So all these are actually very commonly used. But uh, one thing I want to highlight is that sometimes you get medication from different doctors or like uh, that you get from the pharmacy, like OTC kind of drugs. It's, uh, you should be aware that all these medication actually contain certain form of Panadol. If you use it all together and mix it, not uncommon, and you may end up like uh, having an overdose. So you should be using these medications somehow uh, uh, more carefully. Then of course, sometimes the weak opioids, uh, we actually provide you to cope with the very severe pain. All these uh, can uh, help with the symptoms as long as you use it properly and it's not like too prolonged period of time. And uh, another class of uh, very widely used drugs is called NSAIDs. I'm sure you use it like right, from time to time. Um, so of course, a lot of concern about the side effects, especially about the stomach as well as the kidney. So again, it's about how you use it appropriately. Let's say if you use for short duration uh, with the doctor guide you properly, and actually it's okay to use this drug to cope with the pain symptom. And they are truly effective targeting those non-specific mechanical pain. But of course, there are some like uh, topical form. I'm sure you use it uh, also. It's like, for example, those plaster and gel. Uh, compared with those oral tablets, this medication is, has uh, get less absorbed uh, into your body. So it doesn't cause too much uh, effect or adverse effects on your stomach and kidney. So they're actually quite good to use. So there are also like other kinds of drugs that we prescribe for patients, especially those like chronic neck and back pain. Uh, for example, gabapentin, pregabalin, or sometimes uh, what we use is like a so-called antidepressant for chronic pain condition. These are more special drugs usually prescribed only by the specialist. So all these medication may have its like a indication and also like the side effects that worth noting. But I think the more important thing is like the, you, uh, your doctor will of course like prescribe the medication very carefully and choose like what kind of drugs to use. So it's important to, uh, you know, uh, follow the instruction and use it uh, on a regular basis as needed. Okay, uh, of course, a lot of patients may wonder, do I really need to go for an operation or surgery for my back pain? So the truth is, uh, in Singapore, uh, 
I think we offer the operation very carefully, only in very selected patients for their condition. So as I mentioned just now, there are a few warning signs that may indicate the severe underlying problem. So these are the symptoms that uh, alarm you that you should see a doctor uh, uh, early. And usually these are the symptoms that we, uh, sometimes we have to treat with the uh, surgery. For example, if you really have a very severe fracture on your backbone and become, uh, your body become uh, uh, very unstable, the pain is simply so severe that not responding to any medication, and it happens somehow quite recent, our surgeon will actually offer procedure to help to strengthen the broken bones. And uh, slip disc, as I mentioned, most of the time it doesn't really cause a serious problem, but if it does, and it causes like severe weakness or numbness, or sometimes even worse, that you cannot control your urine or motion, then yes, an operation might be needed. Uh, there's very rarely, uh, I mean, there are some cases that uh, there may be cancer that spread into the bone uh, to help with the pain symptom, also help to uh, strengthen uh, your spine. The operation might be needed. So all these, uh, your surgeon will actually choose very carefully. The majority of the back pain do not really need an operation. So uh, besides surgery and the medication there, of course, there are some intervention procedures that can be considered, especially that those we already offer on a regular basis in SGH Pain Management Center. Uh, for example, epidural steroids injection is quite often used for those who have a pinched nerve that causing severe symptom. If the patient doesn't really respond to medication, but somehow they do not want the surgery or the operation is simply too high risk, we offer such kind of injection to actually give like steroids and a local anesthetic targeting specific nerves. All these uh, can be uh, helpful in terms of symptom relief, but unfortunately they are usually like short term. Uh, so the good response will be like three to six month duration, but uh, sometimes we might need to repeat the injection as needed. And of course, there's like small joints pain, as I mentioned just now, between the each segments of the backbone, there may be small joints degenerated and causing pain, whether it happened in the neck or back level. Uh, so sometimes when these patients do not respond to the usual painkiller, we also inject like a local anesthetic of steroids into the joint itself. There are also like a nerve ablation that can be provided at the spine level. Uh, so as an, uh, I think quite similar to the knee ablation, uh, knee nerve ablation of hip uh, nerve ablation as mentioned by Dr. Lim and Wei just now, it can be used for like targeting those nerves supplying the spine. So when we need some like more prolonged uh, like relief, uh, such kind of procedure can be also offered. I think also available in our center. Yeah, so uh, I think that's uh, about uh, what we're going to discuss today. So. Yes, definitely there are a wide range of uh, treatment options available uh, for your back and neck pain. Uh, but a lot of things I want to clarify is actually about the misconception about the, how to recognize the disease and how to handle the symptoms. And as I mentioned, the self-management is actually very important and, uh, in your daily life. Okay, thank you very much everyone for joining us today. So I will hand over to uh, another speaker. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lim, for your very insightful talk. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Tan. Uh, she is an associate consultant at the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine uh, in Singapore General Hospital. She received her undergraduate MBBS from the University College London uh, in the UK and obtained her Master's of Medicine in Anesthesiology degree from National University of Singapore. Uh, her clinical interests are in community-centered holistic pain management and she is currently leading an initiative to improve the care and pain management of high needs patients uh, in the community. Today, she will be speaking to us on the topic of neuropathic pain. Dr. Tan, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Liu, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, good morning and welcome to today's talk on neuropathic pain. I am Dr. Elizabeth Tan, Associate Consultant in the Department of Pain Medicine and Anesthesiology from Singapore General Hospital. In today's discussion, I will talk about what neuropathic pain is, a brief introduction to the common neuropathic pain conditions that our clinic sees, and lastly, an overview on the general approach to treating neuropathic pain. 
Firstly, what is neuropathic pain? The International Association for the Study of Pain defines neuropathic pain as pain that is caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system. In other words, it is pain caused by the damage of body's nerves. Because nerves carry many different types of signals from the body to the brain, when these nerves are damaged, the sensation of neuropathic pain can be very different from what we normally understand as pain. To understand this, let's look at the different types of pain. There is nociceptive pain, which is the type of pain we get from injuries from cuts, bruises, or swelling. When there is tissue injury, the body creates an inflammatory response to help with healing. This causes chemicals to be released into the affected area, which can cause swelling and irritation to the surrounding tissues, thus causing pain. Neuropathic pain is different. It happens when there is an injury to the nervous system, causing the nerves to send abnormal pain signals to the brain. To understand how neuropathic pain is processed differently, let's first look at what the body's normal processing of pain is. All throughout our body, we have somatosensory nerves. These are nerves that are found in our skin, muscles, joints, bones, organs, everywhere in the body. In these nerve endings, there are receptors that sense pain, touch, pressure, temperature, movement, and vibration. When there is an injury such as a cut, bruise, or a broken, broken bone, the pain receptors send signals from the injured area to the spine and then to the brain. These signals are then registered by the brain as pain. Now, let's look at how neuropathic pain is processed differently. Neuropathic pain is caused by an altered or disordered transmission of sensory signals from the nerve endings to the spine and brain. As a result, the pain that people experience is often different from the type of pain you will experience when you have a cut. They often describe the pain as burning or shooting or like an electric shock. It can last even after the initial injury has healed, in some cases even for years. In certain cases, they may develop allodynia, which is when a non-painful sensation is felt as painful. For example, patients with trigeminal neuralgia may find washing their face or brushing their teeth painful. What causes neuropathic pain? It is caused by damage to the nerve endings, but there are various mechanisms of injury. It can be caused by direct trauma to the nerve, for instance, from a cut or a fall, injury during surgery, or as a side effect from medications that may damage the nerves, such as with chemotherapy. Certain viral infections like shingles can also cause damage to the nerve. Sometimes cancers may invade areas of nerve tissues or may compress on nerves causing nerve pain. Poorly controlled diabetes can also lead to complications of neuropathy and neuropathic pain. Some neurological conditions, for example, multiple sclerosis, also affect nerves directly. Long-term alcoholism is also linked to neuropathy. And in some cases, there is no identifiable cause. What are the symptoms of neuropathic pain? Common ways that neuropathic pain has been described are sharp, an electric shock sensation, burning, paining, painful cold, tingling, pins and needles, numb or even itchy. There may be allodynia, which is when there is pain with a non-painful stimulus, or radiation of pain, which is when the pain shoots down along the course of the nerve. An example of this is sciatica. This is when the nerves of the spine are compressed, causing the pain to be felt shooting down the leg instead of the spine, which is where the nerve injury site is. Let me now briefly talk about some common neuropathic pain conditions that we see in our pain management center. Here are some examples of common neuropathic pain conditions. In the interest of time, I will only cover the first three conditions on this list. First, I will talk about trigeminal neuralgia. The trigeminal nerve is a sensory nerve of the face. It carries sensations from the face to your brain. Trigeminal neuralgia is a condition where the trigeminal nerve is affected, causing intense facial pain. One of the main causes is when there is a torturous blood vessel that compresses directly onto the trigeminal nerve. Other causes include nerve tumors, aneurysms or bony abnormalities that press onto the nerve, or sometimes it may be caused by inflammation of the nerve, such as in multiple sclerosis. And of course, sometimes we cannot find the cause. 
The symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia are often quite specific. It is pain over the face, usually over the cheek, nose, upper lip, or jaw, and sometimes the forehead. It is usually one-sided. People describe it as a severe electric current type pain that lasts for seconds to minutes. It can be triggered by normal daily activities that usually don't cause pain, such as chewing on the affected side, brushing teeth, combing hair, shaving, washing the face, especially with cold water, or even just by a cool breeze on the face. The diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia is usually based on the characteristics of the symptoms that the patient tells us that they have. The doctor will usually examine you to look for signs of nerve injury or signs that may suggest other causes of your pain. After that, an MRI of the brain may be ordered to look for any structural causes of the pain, such as a blood vessel pressing on the trigeminal nerve. Once the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia is suspected, a panel of blood tests to look at the patient's blood pump, kidney function, and liver function, as well as a genetic test may be ordered. The doctor may also refer the patient to a specialist depending on the area of pain involved and the likely cause of the pain. The first-line treatment for trigeminal neuralgia is usually with anti-seizure medications. These are generally effective in reducing the pain. Carbamazepine has been shown to be very effective in the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. However, this drug is associated with serious skin disorders in people who have a certain gene. Hence, prior to starting this drug, the doctor may order a genetic test called HLA-B1502 before deciding if the drug is suitable for the patient. Although medications are often effective, about 20% of our patients may not respond to medications or may be unable to tolerate the side effect of the medications. In these cases, more invasive treatment options may be offered. These include steroid injections to the nerve, radiofrequency ablation to the nerve, gamma knife or even surgery, if the scans show that there is a blood vessel that is compressing on the nerve. The image on the right is a procedure called Gasserian ganglion ablation in which a needle is inserted next to the mouth and enters just inside the skull. Heat is then used to burn the nerve that supplies the face. This can help to reduce the pain significantly for patients. The next condition that I will cover on is post neuralgia or post-shingles neuralgia. It is a compli complication that occurs in 10 to 20% of people who have had shingles. It is a long-lasting pain that persists in the same areas of skin that was previously affected by shingles, even after the skin rash has recovered. What causes it? If you have had chickenpox before, the virus caused called varicella zoster virus remains in our bodies even after recovery. Years later, it may reactivate as shingles, during which the virus moves along the nerves to the skin and causes a painful rash of blisters. Sometimes the affected nerves are damaged during the shingles infection, causing it to send abnormal pain signals to the brain even after the skin rash has recovered. post neuralgia presents as a neuropathic type pain over the areas of skin that were previously affected by shingles. If there is still a scar from the rash, the pain normally corresponds with the rash. It is usually in a band on one side of the body, rarely on both. The pain persists even after the rash has healed. It is often described as burning, sharp or aching, or maybe itchy or numb. Sometimes even the movement of clothes over the affected area can cause pain. With regards to treatment, prevention is always better than cure. In those who are not sure if they have had chickenpox before, the shingles vaccination is recommended, especially in the elderly or those planning to get pregnant in the future. Those who develop signs and symptoms of shingles should see their doctor early. Treating it early with antivirals such as acyclovir can reduce the risk of developing post-hepatic neuralgia. In terms of painkillers, a nerve pain medication such as gabapentin or pregabalin, otherwise known as Lyrica, can be started at low doses first and gradually titrated up to an effective dose. Simple painkillers can also be used for periods when there is worsening in the pain. There are also topical options such as local anesthetic creams or patches that can be applied to the painful sites. Our third condition is diabetes and its association with neuropathic pain. Diabetes is unfortunately becoming very prevalent in our society and we are seeing more patients with long-term complications of it, one of which is diabetic neuropathy. About 10 to 25% of patients with diabetes develop painful diabetic neuropathy. 
Poorly controlled long-standing diabetes contributes to the development of neuropathy because of the following factors. Firstly, blood, large fluctuations in blood sugar levels. Secondly, reduced blood circulation to the feet and hence affecting blood supply to the nerves and the tissues there. And thirdly, altered nerve fiber density. What are the signs and symptoms of painful diabetic neuropathy? It usually presents in a glove and stocking distribution, which is that the hands, fingers, feet and toes are usually affected first. It can progress on to involve the thighs, buttocks, hips and chest. The symptoms are usually progressive from sensory loss or numbness, pain and sometimes even to weakness. It is often described as burning, tingling, sharp, shooting, painful cold, numb or crampy. It is usually worse at night. It can be extremely sensitive to touch. Some patients even say that the, pain, the feeling of the blanket just touching their feet at night is painful. And lastly, there may also be other signs of infection, ulcers, or even bone damage. Neuropathic pain from diabetes can be challenging to treat. The management of neuropathy from diabetes is often done with the involvement of different specialists working as a team. The primary physician's team, which includes either the endocrinologist or a GP and a nurse specialist, has the main role of monitoring and titrating the diabetic medications. These patients may also be referred to a neurologist if the neuropathy is severe or to a pain physician to help with the management of the pain. Podiatrists are also uh, helpful with educating patients on proper foot care. First and foremost, good blood sugar control is the most important factor to manage. Evidence suggests that good control of blood sugars and avoidance of large fluctuations in blood sugar levels decreases the risk of development or worsening of neuropathy. It also helps to prevent ulcer formation and other complications of diabetes. In terms of pain medications, simple painkillers like Panadol or Ibuprofen may not be effective enough for neuropathic type pain. Other types of medications that we may prescribe to help with this kind of pain are anti-seizure medicines and antidepressant medicines. The pain physicians may also prescribe local anesthetic uh, patches. And sometimes acupuncture may also be helpful in reducing this type of pain. What treatment options do we have to manage neuropathic pain? Of course, some of these conditions cannot be treated or cured, but our goal as pain physicians is to help make the pain more bearable for our patients using different types of pain medicines or interventions. Medications-wise, as we know, the cause of nerve pain is different from pain due to inflammation or bruising. So the type of painkillers needed to treat neuropathic pain is also different. Because neuropathic pain is due to abnormal electrical activity of the nerves, the medications that we use to work the, the medications that we use work directly on the nerves to reduce the electrical conduction of pain signals to the brain. Nerve pain medicines usually include anti-seizure and antidepressant medications. They work by suppressing or dampening the pain signals from the nerves to the brain. These medications take time to work and also carry side effects such as drowsiness, blurred vision, nausea, constipation and urinary retention. That is why it takes time for your doctor to titrate the dose to an effective level while trying to avoid too much side effects for you. And it is very important not to self-titrate these medications yourself without consulting your doctor first. Nerve pain medications should be taken regularly so that they can maintain their effect on the nerves or chemicals in the brain for the long term. On top of that, the doctor will usually prescribe some standby painkillers for painful episodes. These range from simple painkillers such as Panadol or NSAIDs for mild to moderate pain to opioids like Tramadol, Codeine or even Morphine for moderate to severe pain. Over time, as your doctor titrates the doses of the nerve pain medicines, the pain should get better control and you may find yourself requiring fewer doses of these standby medications. In certain more complex neuropathic pain conditions that do not respond well to oral painkillers, Intravenous infusions of medications may be an option to help manage the pain. However, additional monitoring of the heart and mental state is often required while on these infusions, as these infusions carry higher risks of side effects. This may mean being monitored continuously in the treatment room for a few hours, or in some cases, a hospital admission may be required. Depending on the type and cause of pain, there may be more invasive options to treat the pain. These can range from steroid injections to the nerve, affected nerve, radiofrequency ablations, or even surgery. 
the suitability of these procedures for your condition should be discussed with your doctor. Some conditions may benefit from physical therapy or physiotherapy, such as in sciatica or cervical radiculopathy or phantom limb pain. Our pain management centre in SGH also works closely with our certified acupuncturists who have special interest in managing different pain conditions. Overall, there's usually not a single solution to managing chronic neuropathic pain, and we often employ a multidisciplinary approach. This includes tackling all aspects, the biomedical, psychological, and social aspects of our patient's well-being. Our treatment plan for you is usually a combination of medications or procedures, physical therapy, and sometimes with complementary medicine. Some of our patients may benefit from seeing our pain psychologist to help in pain education and teaching techniques to cope with living with pain. In patients with concurrent depression or anxiety issues, we can also refer them to our psychiatrist in helping to manage their mental wellness. And last but not least, getting a good social support network has been shown to improve people's well-being and in turn their pain. In summary, neuropathic pain is complex and is often experienced differently by different people. It is usually treated with anti-seizure medicines or antidepressant medicines and these should be strictly taken according to the doctor's prescription and not self-titrated without the doctor's knowledge. There are different ways of treating neuropathic pain, and the treatment options are tailored to your condition. Lastly, not only is our physical well-being important, but by improving our mental well-being, it can help us to cope better with chronic neuropathic pain. I have come to the end of my talk. Thank you for listening in. We will now continue to the Q&A session. I will hand over to Dr. Liu now. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for oops, sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for uh, sharing your uh, wonderful thoughts of uh, about neuropathic pain for us. So we're going to go through some Q and A sessions. Uh, I thank everyone for all your uh, questions. Uh, there are a lot of questions here, and I think some of them have been answered in the chat already. Uh, but we're going to bring up some questions uh, for live discussion. But in the meantime, you can keep your questions coming, and we'll try to answer them as far as time permits. Um, can I know whether there are any questions? Okay, so the first question will go to Dr. Uh, Lim. Uh, Dr. Lim, um, can we ask, uh, what are the cons of nerve ablation? Uh, the nerves are there for a purpose. Uh, so what is the harm if uh, the function is suppressed? Please, am I answering? Or... Uh, yeah. Could you answer that question for us? Okay. So uh, the disadvantages uh, is that, uh, of course, uh, as the disease progresses, uh, it is, as mentioned, it is not a cure for the disease. As a result, uh, the disease may still progress. Uh, however, the benefit of the nerve ablation is that uh, it provides a period of uh, reduced pain so that it hopefully uh, allows you to participate in physiotherapy, strengthening of the muscles around the, 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 the joint so that it, it slows down the disease progression. Uh, uh, re regarding the, the question on what is the harm, the harm is that uh, the disease may still progress and uh, the underlying uh, disease process is not cured. I am done, please. Thank you so much. Okay, the next question we have is, uh, does the effectiveness of these therapies decrease with each occasion um, that it is done over time? So I think this question also goes to Dr. Lim. It may or may not. Uh, for example, certain uh, using uh, the gel injection, for example, uh, at the start, uh, it may not. Uh, you may require uh, one or two or even three injections to fully appreciate the effectiveness of the injection. Uh, however, uh, as we discussed, that uh, the disease process continues and it may become more severe uh, when the when when the disease process is in the more advanced stages. Uh, such treatment uh, may not be as effective anymore. So uh, the answer to the question is yes and no. Yes, because uh, it may be less effective when the disease uh, has progressed. Uh, no, uh, if your disease, uh, if, if your 
disease has uh, your, your, or if, if your disease has uh, remained the same, then it should remain effective. Uh, next question, Chris. Thank you so much, Dr. Lim. All right, next question will be, will physiotherapy help for a senior who is 87 years old and has osteoarthritis of the knee, hips, as well as spondylosis, where surgery is not uh, preferred? Um, I think this I can question... answer? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, physiotherapy, or physiotherapy definitely will help. Uh, what is... Um... One, one common misconception that uh, patients often have about physiotherapy is that uh, they expect to see the physiotherapist, uh, do some exercises and uh, hope that uh, the, the pain will uh, go away after a few days. However, that is, that is not the intention. Uh, we basically uh, request a patient to see the physiotherapist maybe once in uh, three months or six months or yearly so that the appropriate exercises can be recommended to the patient and when the appropriate exercises are being performed it allows a strengthening of the muscles around the the joints and be the knee or the hip or the back so that the joint will not receive asymmetrical pressure because the main reason why a certain a knee uh, osteoarthritis occurs uh, it's because of inappropriate, inappropriate posture in walking, sitting, standing, resulting in joint space narrowing in, uh, in, in a specific area. So therefore, it is necessary to, to seek the help of a physiotherapist to make sure that uh, such uh, incidences is reduced, that uh, they will recommend that uh, you, you, you uh, walk or sit in appropriate posture to prevent the uh, progression of the disease. Next question, please. Thank you so much. Okay, the next question goes to Dr. Elizabeth Tan. Uh, how does acoxia work? Is it commonly prescribed for pain management? Is it recommended for long-term use, for example, six months? Okay, thanks for this question. This is a very important question because we do get this question quite often in our pain clinic. So acoxia is a non-serodal non anti-inflammatory medication. It helps to reduce inflammation and it's very effective for inflammatory type pain, for example, uh, with bruising or with bone fractures. So um, some people find this extremely effective, um, and we do see quite a lot of people who have taken it long-term, like you have said. However, there are side effects to taking acoxia in the long term. Firstly, if it is taken for a long period of time, like for example, you mentioned six months regularly, it can affect the kidneys, which in some cases may be irreversible damage. It can also affect the heart, uh, and also, um, it can also give you things like uh, gastric ulcers. So I would not recommend taking it in the long term, but in short courses, uh, for example, one to two weeks when the pain is severe, that should be fairly safe. Of course, there are some people who already have things like kidney damage um, or uh, poor kidney function who may not, uh, we may not recommend this drug for them, but this should be discussed with your doctor depending on your health condition. Thank you so much. Next question would go to Dr. Lin. Um, Dr. Lin, uh, can degeneration of the cervical spinal disc be healed without surgery? Okay, thank you for the question. So I believe I mentioned just now, the disc degeneration actually happen as aging, as we're getting old, and it's kind of like a natural process. Of course, sometimes injury make it worse and like happen faster than usual. Uh, I wouldn't say that the spinal disc degeneration can be healed without surgery. So as degeneration uh, happens, it's something really irreversible. Of course, with proper exercise and a good posture and the lifestyle changes, uh, the progress can be slowed down. Um, so without surgery, usually we use proper physiotherapy. And if it does cause pain symptoms, certain medication can help if that answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, I guess, will go to Dr. Elizabeth Tan. Uh, what is chronic regional pain syndrome? I think uh, maybe the question would be, what is complex regional pain syndrome? Okay. Um, complex regional pain syndrome uh, is a condition that is quite specific. Um, it has to fulfill a number of 
uh, criteria which uh, your which will include things like skin changes, um, temperature changes in the area, and it's normally a pain that occurs after an injury has happened to the area, uh, and in some cases the pain is not well controlled and persists for a long period of time, and over time the body actually reacts to this pain um, differently uh, because of the nerves being affected. So um, it is a uh, it is a condition that does need to require certain uh, it needs to fulfill certain um, diagnosis criteria before we can call it complex regional pain syndrome. Um, it is not that common. Um, thankfully, in our in our patient population, but when it happens, it should be treated as soon as possible to avoid it from becoming worse. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you very much. Okay, um, this question goes to Dr. Lim. Um, my GP offers some kind of uh, gel injection to the knee. It has to be done regularly, maybe once a year. Is it safe? Uh... I just want to confirm that uh, if the injection is uh, similar to what we offer in uh, the SH pain management center, which is a monovis or uh, synthes injection, uh, and uh, as mentioned in uh, my earlier talk, it's a type of lubricant, uh, it can be done regularly uh, every year. And some patients uh, may do it once uh, every six months. However, uh, the reason I wanted to address this question is because uh, it depends on the effectiveness of the injection. If the, in, if the injection provides you with a satisfactory pain relief for six months to one year, I say yes, you probably should uh, continue this management uh, if you only require every six months or one year. However, after such injections and you find that the pain, uh, you, you only get pain relief for two weeks or one month, then I would say maybe your disease process uh, is, is, is quite advanced and such treatment may not be uh, suitable for you because you, you can't be having such injection uh, every month. So uh, yes, it is safe if it is effective for you. It lasts six months, one year. But uh, if it only lasts a couple of weeks, then perhaps uh, may not be suitable for you. This question, please, please. Actually, uh, on the same vein, I just want to ask if uh, a patient who presents to you with uh, failure of um, this hyaluronic acid injection, um, would you offer uh, a, a RFA uh, to, and what are your uh, outcomes so far? So uh, RFA refers to uh, the radiofrequency ablation. So uh, as uh, Dr. Liu uh, mentioned, uh, if the gel injection is not suitable, then we potentially can explore uh, the effectiveness of uh, RFA, radio frequency ablation. Uh, but as we discussed, there are some uh, advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages being that uh, as the nerves are being numb, uh, you may not know if the disease has actually progressed worse. Uh, and you may need a serial x-rays of the knee to uh, kind of uh, confirm whether the disease uh, has worsened. Uh, and, uh, but however, it is a, a, an option that uh, can be explored uh, and can be effective for patients who have knee osteoarthritis uh, and would prefer not to have surgery. Thank you very much. Okay, next question will go to Dr. Lin. Uh, if the scans are not helpful in diagnosis, why does my specialist recommend MRI for low back pain a couple of years ago? All right, I think this is a very good question. So I guess I will clarify further. So uh, most of the time we decide whether you need a further imaging study, whether it's X-ray or MRI, after we do assessment you first. So that means we ask about your symptoms and we do examination. And only when we notice like there, it could be some like severe underlying cause, then we will order the MRI. But in a sense, like more general sense, like, oh, should I MRI everyone with back pain? Then definitely not, because as I mentioned for a reason, uh, number one is that it's not gonna help with the diagnosis and the management. And number two is actually some kind of conclusion can be quite confusing. It doesn't really pinpoint to the actual cause. So that's why it's not needed most of the time. But yeah, let's say you already have a prolonged symptom not resolving within six weeks. As I mentioned, 10% of patients do have such kind of severe problem or may be due to such kind of severe problem. 
then yes, MRI could be still needed for to guide our further treatment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next one. Is tendonitis curable or will it be chronic permanently? How much exercise or what kind of workout is advised for chronic tendonitis? I guess uh, if anyone can help me answer this question, that'd be great. Uh, I, I, I requested to answer this question. Okay, so, so I'll answer. <laughs> so uh, uh, this, this question is quite relevant because uh, it's something that is fairly common. So the question whether it is curable, uh, the short answer is uh, most likely yes. Because as the term suggests, tendonitis, it is an inflammation of the tendon. And usually the tendon is inflamed from uh, some degree of uh, overuse or uh, uh, inappropriate uh, movement. Uh, so therefore, in the acute phase where you are diagnosed with uh, inflammation of the tendon, uh, I, I would say uh, for the first uh, couple of days or week, uh, maybe avoid any exercise because you want the acute inflammation to uh, subside. So, uh, and, and it, it should, if there is no tear of the tendon, it should uh, naturally heal. Uh, however, what is important is that uh, to uh, recognize that uh, it has occurred due to uh, inappropriate uh, activities or, or movement. So therefore, it may be uh, advisable to see a physiotherapy uh, to see what is the issue. Because some of the reasons why uh, certain tendons become overused uh, maybe because of inappropriate movement or exercise. For example, uh, uh, the way someone runs, you know, it, it is uh, uh, the joints are slightly slanted, resulting in uh, overuse or overstretching of certain tendons and resulting in the inflammation. So, so therefore, uh, after a period of uh, healing, when the tendon is eventually uh, recovered, then maybe worthwhile uh, visiting a physiotherapist uh, to. Uh, Find out what uh what what is the issue with your posture, so that uh, such uh, inflammation can be avoided in the future. Uh, thanks, please. Thanks, Thank question. you so much. Okay. Um, will long term physiotherapy prevent degeneration of the knee and hip due to old age? Uh, I guess the Dr. Lim. Yep. So uh, I mentioned briefly in uh, my previous uh answer that uh, yes, it will, because uh, as, as mentioned, uh, many uh, degeneration of the knee, hip, or even a, hip, or even a spine occurs due to asymmetrical pressure of, of the back. Uh, if uh, I, I show the image of a diseased knee uh, in my slide, and in that image, you can actually see that uh, the inner part of the knee joint is narrow, not the outer part. So in the very early stages, uh, such uh, degeneration, uh, aging issues occur because of asymmetrical pressure. So therefore, it is necessary to see a physiotherapy to make sure that uh, the muscles uh, who, who will teach you the, the exercises that you must perform uh, quite diligently a uh, few times a week or even daily if possible, so that the muscles around the joint is strengthened and there is less pressure in the joint space uh, to uh, slow down uh, the disease process uh, and reduce uh, the symptoms. Thanks, Pete. Thank you so much. All right, uh, the next question goes to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Tan. Can osteoporosis cause neuropathic pain? Uh, yes, um, it is possible, especially if, for example, um, osteoporosis leads to things like um, a collapse uh, vertebral, meaning a collapse vertebral bone, bone so uh, fractures in the spine area. Um, it may uh, compress onto nerves, uh, leading to neuropathic pain. So yes, it, it may occur, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, may, this question, may I know why my nerve pain can suddenly go away for an hour or so, uh, but it will still come back, uh, Dr. Elizabeth? Okay, so uh, when the nerve is affected, so if, for example, if the nerve pain is caused by compression of the nerve, sometimes this pain can come on because of, uh, let's say, uh, let's talk about um, degeneration of the back. If the nerve pain is caused by a compression um, of the nerve caused by the degeneration of the back, 
certain postures or certain positions may trigger um, the compression, may trigger the bone from pressing onto the nerve, causing the pain to come on. And then when you change your position, it's no longer pressing on the nerve, and so the pain goes away. So we, it is quite common to say for people to say that certain positions bring on the pain, um, or like for example, they're walking halfway and the pain comes on, and when they stop walking, the pain goes away. So uh, yes, it is likely because the pain is caused by a compression that goes on and off on the nerve. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Uh, okay, um, I have persistent neck and shoulder pain on one side. I tried to do stretching and running and usually feel better right after that. But the pain becomes worse the next day. Should I refrain from stretching or running instead? Uh, Dr. Lin, could you help yeah. us with this? Right, actually, I, I tried to type the answer just now. But I think it's a lot of, uh, lot of like uh, patient may have the same question. So, I guess this really depends on whether you are doing uh, the exercise appropriately, because sometimes we may be a bit overdoing it, uh, or maybe we are not doing it in the way that is recommended. So that's why I say sometimes seeing a video therapist uh, may actually help because uh, different patient may have different needs and uh, exercise can be tailored to suit each individual. Uh, so on the other hand, is uh, it could be also due to like, uh, for example, some short relief after exercise, but somehow the pain problem is still there. So not saying that uh, pain is going to be completely resolved with exercise. So still, we might need painkiller to help us to cope with the symptom. So do we really need to refrain from such kind of exercise, for example, stretching and running? Again, it really depends on whether it's the best one for you or not. Let's say if you somehow already seen a physiotherapist and uh, you've been guided to do all these, but you found that it's still hurting a lot, then maybe you can choose other form of like, exercise you found really helpful. So it could be something really like not really strenuous or even like very slow pacing, for example, like a Tai Chi or yoga. As long as you found that you can tolerate it well with or without like, any painkiller to help, I guess that will be actually working for you. Yeah, so it uh, depends on what you found is most helpful. You can choose your, uh, the exercise you like. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. Uh, next question. Um, is platelet-rich plasma effective in treating uh, knee arthritis? Uh, I will take the question, Chris. Thank you. Uh, the, the short answer is no. Uh, the evidence is actually quite poor. So we, as a result, we do not offer it as a treatment in the SH Pain Management Center. Thank you very much. All right, uh, next question. Um, maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Lin to help us answer this. Due to chronic long-term pains, uh, consuming painkillers, say, consecutively daily for a week, say, bi-monthly or quarterly becomes lifelong. Will such lifelong consumption harm the organs such as the kidney? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chris. So uh, again, so it depends on what kind of medication you are actually using and uh, how you're using. So for example, I believe the painkiller we're referring to here is the NSAIDs, or non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. So these kind of drugs, if you use it consecutively daily for a week or like uh, long term, they could harm your kidney, especially if you already have some kidney problem from other causes, for example, diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension. Yeah, but should we be too worried about it? So again, it's about how we use it and whether your doctor give you the correct advice and you follow them appropriately. So if you use it like sparingly or like you kind of like rotate it with other drugs, for example, uh, maybe codeine sometimes or maybe Panadol instead, and uh, watch your kidney regularly by uh, blood sampling. All these may actually help you to prevent such kind of injury happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So it's about the safe use of medication uh, rather than avoiding just because there's a small risk of harm to the organs and through patient uh, selection as well. Uh, thank you. Um, is there a next question? 
Okay, um, this one goes to Dr. Elizabeth Tan. I have had shingles on my right upper back about 30 years ago. Uh, sometimes I experience pain that is in that affected area while walking. My back is breaking. I was told that shingles damage the nerve and causes the pain. Uh, please advise. Okay, so uh, as mentioned in the talk, the, usually the shingles pain will correspond to where your previous uh, shingles rash was. Um, and if it does correspond, then it may possibly be post-hepatic neuralgia. So uh, for this, we will usually need to assess, make sure that you're not having a new infection, um, and, and make sure that the cause of it is not from another cause. And if it truly is from post-hepatic neuralgia, we can start on uh, medications like anti-seizure or antidepressant medications. And this is often taken for a period of time regularly in order to suppress the activity of this nerve uh, and suppressing the nerve, the neuropathic type pain that's caused by that. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Um, I think another question for you. Uh, is uh, shingle vaccination for everyone? How about people who have had chickenpox before? Okay, so, so this is a very good question. Um, yes, I would recommend shingles vaccination for people who have or have not had chickenpox before. Even if you have had chickenpox, um, it can help to boost the immunity. Um, this is especially important for women who have uh, who are planning to have children later because um, if you've not had chickenpox before, you do not have the antibodies for it. Um, there is a risk if you do get chickenpox or uh, during the pregnancy that it can affect the baby. Um, for elderly patients or people who are also immunocompromised, meaning those with poor immunity, it may also be beneficial. However, um, this needs to be discussed with your doctor, of course, depending on your health condition. Um, there are times where the shingles vaccination is not suitable. For example, if you previously had a very bad reaction to the shingles vaccination, then we would not recommend this. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Okay, um, I think this question goes to Dr. Lin. Uh, what would cause pain at the tailbone when sitting on the bed, but no pain when sitting on the chair? Yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, this is something actually related to the tailbone itself. It's like uh, sometimes it's, again, we don't exactly know the exact cause of it. It's like uh, some people believe it's kind of degeneration or maybe there's an inflammation happen at this particular joint. So uh, of course, if uh, like you do have the symptom, which is actually quite typical that you described here, you may want to see a doctor for further assessment because it's like uh, sometimes it could be due to other internal organ problems that we don't really know, we don't want to miss out. So that maybe uh, after further examination, we can decide whether it's truly the tailbone problem or not. And then further treatment can be given, for example, painkiller, uh, choose the correct cushion for you to sit on, or maybe injection therapy. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, I think this question will go to Dr. Lin. Can you explain what annular tear is and how to prevent it from getting worse? All right, so again, another question related to the, slip, uh, the disc itself. As I mentioned, the disc is something like a soft, jelly kind of material that uh, cushion the backbone to help to stable the spine and to reduce the shock. Uh, it happens when, for example, there's an injury or when there's just a normal aging process. The material become a bit weak uh, and some of them even get ruptured. So that's why you may see such kind of tear, maybe on the scan. I believe you saw it on some MR report, whether you are yourself having it or your friend or your family member having it. Okay, could it be something really serious? I guess it really depends. It could, because I mentioned some of these changes are just considered as like a normal aging. It may not be the one causing your symptom. But let's say if you do really concern about it and you want to know what to prevent it getting worse, I guess uh, a good posture, whether you're sitting or standing is actually very important. And whether your work involves certain kind of like activities such as like lifting, having things or not, uh, yes, I guess we should avoid like really uh, lifting like excessive weight and uh, it may actually cause the things worse. But other than that, there's not really a, a medication or any form of treatment may actually uh, like, you know, heal it. So uh, all we can do is to slow down the degen degeneration process. All right, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Okay, uh, this is a final question. Uh, my 
elderly mum who is 81 years old has been diagnosed with osteoarthritis many years back, uh, as well as knee pain, uh, for which she has been recommended knee replacement but was too afraid to go for it. Uh, as she aged, uh, she complains of more pains and has and has been uh, seeking TCM to relieve the pain. I'm thinking of asking her uh, to go to pain management. Not sure whether she can go through polyclinic uh, to ask for referral or she has to go back to the SGH specialist clinic to do so. Um, I think I answered this. Um, so the short answer is that uh, you can get a referral from any uh, polyclinic um, or any uh, CHAS um, GP. Uh, but you can also get it from any uh, SGH uh, specialist clinic as well. So either way is fine. Um, there are also some questions uh, where uh, people wanted to especially see uh, Dr. Lin, Dr. Uh, Lim or Dr. Tan. Uh, and if you want to do so, you can also make appointments uh, via the Health Buddy app. But unfortunately, uh, if you want to choose the pain physician you're seeing, uh, that will incur uh, uh, private charges. Otherwise, from the polyclinics and all that, you'll be uh, eligible for government subsidies. Um, so, you know, uh, I thank everyone uh, for joining us. I, I heard that there are about 800 of you who have joined us uh, this morning. And uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful turnout and a lot of great questions asked. You know, I, I hope that uh, most of you have gotten your questions answered. Um, and uh, I wish all of you uh, the very best uh, and have a good uh, weekend ahead. I'd like to thank all our speakers here today, as well as um, members from our uh, patient liaison team for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful talk for us today. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah.